Welcome to Snow Country Stories Japan. My name is Peter Carnell, a freelance guide and writer based in Nagano, and this is a podcast about life and travel in Japan's legendary Yukiguni. Before jumping into today's interview, I want to let you know that this episode is the second last of season one of the pod. The next episode, which will be episode 12, will be released on August 6, and I'll then take a break until coming back with season two in September. In between seasons, I'll upload a previous episode or two that I think are worth listening again, or in case you miss them upon their release. As always, thank you to everyone who is listening, and I'm looking forward to season two as we continue to explore Japan's snow country together. In today's episode, I speak with Iwanami Yuki, a renowned photographer living in the snow country area of Aizu in Fukushima. As a photographer, Yuki's work is of course visual, so I encourage you to listen to this podcast in conjunction with visiting his website, www.yukiiwanami.com, and follow him on Instagram at Yuki Iwanami to look through his catalogue of beautiful work both in Japan and abroad. His work often explores the relationship between people and landscape, and in particular, what happens when those connections are broken. Through this podcast, I intend to profile artists and artisans living and working in the snow country, as I did in episode three of Tengu and Taiko, an interview with a one dimensional woman, especially those that you might not have yet had the chance to discover. In that regard, I want to profile Yuki in his own right, but in a sense, this episode is also a follow up to episode seven. Life After the Quake Guiding, Cycling, and the Essence of Japan. In that episode, I spoke with Kevin Kato, a guide and writer based in Matsumoto, Nagano. As of March 2011, Kevin was living in Fukushima when the Great East Japan earthquake struck, the earthquake that triggered the tsunami which devastated large areas of Japan's Pacific coast and resulted in the meltdown of reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Those events led Kevin and his family to leave Fukushima, an experience he wrote a book about titled For Now, After the Quake, A Father's Journey, events he was good enough to discuss during our interview. It was an engaging episode and one that elicited feedback from listeners. Here's a clip from our chat. On that day,、uh, I was with my three year old son at his little preschool, his Hoikuen, and everyone. All the other kids, there were about a dozen other kids, and they were all with their mom, so I was the only guy there.、Uh, but we were up on the second floor of this preschool, and I was just reaching for a paper cup of tea. We were taking a break, and I was holding my son, I was reaching for this tea, and I remember like just a fraction of a second of something moving very slightly. And then all of a sudden, it felt like the entire building we were in didn't start shaking back and forth. It felt like it had actually lifted up vertically off the ground and boom, slammed back down again. And then everything started shaking back and forth. So, right away,、uh, beyond the shock of like, holy smokes, I've never experienced that before. Now it's just this incredibly strong, incredibly. Uh, violent shaking back and forth and very fast. Do, 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 do. And right away, I, saw, I thought to myself, okay, this is not like any other. If you didn't get the chance to listen to it, you might want to go back and listen to that episode before listening on to my chat with Yuki today. During that episode, I provided a summary of the events of March 11th, 2011, and Kevin's story is a compelling one. Following on from Kevin's interview, I was still thinking about his experience and the aftermath in Fukushima when I was introduced to the photography of Iwanami Yuki. Based in Fukushima, Yuki's work deals with the displacement of people as a result of human actions such as war and trafficking and natural disasters, including earthquakes. And over recent years, he has come to focus on the stories of people and communities affected by the triple disaster of 2011. I wanted to squeeze this episode in before the end of season one in follow up to my chat with Kevin, and at the same time, in other ways, in contrast to it. The events of March 2011 led Kevin and his family to leave Fukushima and ultimately relocate to Nagano. But as you will hear from Yuki, it is those events that brought him to Fukushima 
and over a number of years, he came to establish a connection with the region, a connection that ultimately led he and his family to relocate to Fukushima and the snow country region of Aizu. It's important to note that during the interview, Yuki on occasion refers to living in and his love for Tohoku, a name that you might not be familiar with. Tohoku accounts for the northeast region of Japan's main island of Honshu, comprised of six prefectures, Fukushima, where Yuki lives, Miyagi, Yamagata, Akita, Aomori, and Iwate. It is a large region of which the entirety of Yamagata, Akita, Aomori, and Iwate prefectures are designated as snow country, while specific areas of Fukushima and Miyagi carry that designation, but it does not apply to the entirety of those two prefectures. The areas of Fukushima are most notably affected by the earthquake, tsunami, and nearby nuclear reactor are not designated as snow country. However, Fukushima is a large prefecture in which Yuki's hometown of Aizu very much is, an area known for its heavy snow, natural beauty, and ski resorts. I want to apologize for the audio quality of the interview. It was recorded remotely and we experienced a few technical issues on the day and needed to jump between apps to get it recorded. So it's not perfect, but after a good polish, I'm very happy to share Yuki's story with you. I want to say a big thank you to Yuki for making time to chat and bearing with me as we work through the recording issues on the day. As a result, the interview is a little shorter than others, but I hope it's just as interesting. Make sure to listen on after our chat as I'll come back to provide a summary of what occurred at the plant, Yuki's work, and what I took from our chat. I hope you enjoy. My guest on the podcast today is Iwanami Yuki, a renowned photographer based in Fukushima, whose work in both Japan and abroad explores themes that I think are relevant to this podcast and the snow country in general. Uh, Yuki, thanks for speaking with me today. How are you? Um, I'm good. Anyway, thanks, Peter. So Yuki, I know you live in Fukushima in a town called Aizu Misato, uh, nearby the popular ski resorts of Aizu, which are part of the wider Bandai Asahi National Park. I've not been there myself, but I believe it's a very beautiful area. How long have you lived in that part of the snow country? About five years. Five years. And are you, so you're not originally from that area. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Nagano. I love the mountains and the snows. Scenery of snow is my favorite landscape. I feel comfortable. When the, I was uh, sur- surrounded from mountains, I loved snow and mountains, so I, I choose this uh, location. Are you a, uh, a skier or snowboarder yourself? I do uh, skiing, a little bit snowboard. So Yuki, the reason we're speaking to today, and again, thank you so much for making time, is to discuss your work as a photographer. So can you give me a little bit of information about your background and how you came to work as a photographer based there? In Aizu? It's a long story, but uh, <laughs> I will try to make a brief. <laughs> I love I love to travel all, all around the world. And when I a uh, university student, at that time I, I live in Tokyo. I have been to a lot of countries and uh, start to take a photograph. Gradually, uh, I love uh, uh, photographing more than traveling. <laughs> so this is uh, my career starting. After that, uh, after graduation, graduation I, want, I wanted to work as a photographer and the job as a photographer is limited in Japan. One way is uh, to join a newspaper company I joined the newspaper company 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I don't remember. (laughs) (laughs) I worked as a photographer in a newspaper company named Yomi Uri Shimbun, based in Tokyo. I worked there for 11 years. While I'm a part of uh, that newspaper company, the Great East, Great East. The Great East Japan earthquake. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the Great East Japan earthquake. Okay. And tsunami and uh, the nuclear accident. I love the Tohoku region because mm. uh, before that, I 
was based in Sendai. Sendai is a, a big city in Tohoku region. I photographed many places in Tohoku. I a big concern with this disaster. So I wanted to photograph him or make an article, something. With your previous job with the newspaper, they were sending you there to photograph after the tsunami and the nuclear meltdown. That was part of your job? That's right. I went to Tokoku from Tokyo for three years after the disaster. But I wanted to make a article and a photograph more and more. So I decided to quit the job and decided to be a freelance and decided to live in Fukushima because Fukushima had the biggest problem of nuclear accident. In a previous episode of this podcast, I spoke uh, with a guest named Kevin Kato. Kevin uh, used to live in Fukushima at the time of the earthquake, tsunami and meltdown. And during that interview, we discussed those events and his experience of leaving Fukushima, which he wrote a book about, and he's since been living in Nagano. Uh, your work as a photographer took you to that area uh, to document the aftermath of that disaster so, but then you chose to stay. So in many ways, your story is kind of the opposite to his. So what did you see in Fukushima? What did you see in Tohoku that made you want to, to stay there and be based there? The reason, uh, I don't know why, but uh, I think that reason that Kevin uh, moved to Nagano is uh, to escape from uh, dangers. I think, I think, I think, but I... I, I imagine, but uh, time has passed. I thought that uh, the uh, danger of uh, radioactivity became less and less. So I thought that uh, that's okay to move to Fukushima. Fukushima is so big. The region I live is far from the uh, power plant. I thought that this is not dangerous. I'm interested to talk about your specific projects. Uh, looking at your website, um, your photography is really wonderful, very emotive. And the specific projects uh, that you've done regarding the uh, aftermath of the tsunami and the meltdown, projects including Blue Persimmons, uh, One Last Hug, Threads in the Dark, and Kara Suzaki. Uh, looking through that those works, you're kind of, if I'm understanding your intention correctly, you're exploring the loss on many levels, from very personal loss of people who have lost lost their children, siblings, relatives, to the material loss of losing their homes, and the more existential loss of uh, losing connection to landscape, community, tradition. And also looking at some of your previous work outside of Japan in countries including Nepal, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, it seems like this is a common theme in your work. Uh, is that correct as to these are the themes that interest you? And if so, why are you interested in these topics? Yeah, as you said, that uh, i interested in uh, humans and uh, human cultures and uh, relationship and of uh, between the human and land. So I I thought that I I I am interested in humans. Your work seems to explore what happens if the connection between people and their land is broken, either through natural disaster or human action. And I'm just wondering, is that correct? And if so, what are your thoughts on that? If 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 people do lose their connection to their home, do you have any thoughts on what's the importance of that? Why it matters? As I said before, I I I love mountains and snowing. Uh, this is my my uh, treasure. I mean, this uh, experience and uh, land make me. I think uh, everyone was make made from. Uh, 
their hometowns, their land. Here in Fukushima, people have been divided from、uh, their land. This is very, very big、uh, subject, I think. I, I know, Yuki, looking at some of your other work、uh, overseas, I, as I said, in countries including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Cambodia,、uh, you explore many of the similar issues of people who are displaced or disconnected from their homes. I just wondered when you do your work or your projects that you've looked at the aftermath of what happened in、uh, Fukushima with the tsunami and power plant. Does it, does it affect you in a different way from seeing it overseas to seeing it happen in your own country? What's, what's the effect of you on you as a photographer? Yes,、uh, as you said, I made the story、uh, of、uh, the refugees、uh, before this tsunami. As you said, I, I'm interested in the、uh, displaced people. And of course, the situation. In Fukushima, i s、uh, like refugees. So, this is a very、uh, similar situation. Yuki, may I ask, what is the situation in Fukushima now in relation to the power plant? Is there still an exclusion zone? And what's it like to go there when you are there to, fo- to photograph? 12 years have passed from disaster, but、uh, the off limits area is still existed. Residents have not been、uh, able to return in the、uh, limit area, even if not in that area. Many areas have been、uh, no go zone. So, gradually, yeah, gradually the no zone, the、uh, exclusion area has been lifted gradually, but there, there's still some areas where the no zone. Uh, is still in place. You can't, you can't go in there. Is that correct? People can、uh, live in the g a m e of the area. They, they can, but、uh, only a few people h a s came back. So, is, is your experience that people might want to go back because it's, it's their home, but for many reasons they can't go back? That's right. <laughs> what, what does it teach you about what's the importance of people? And connection to the land, connection to their homes?、Hmm, I think it's very important. I think one of the most important o n e Almost like having the ability to live in your home. Yeah, have, yeah. Have the ability to live in, in your home. What do you believe happens if you break the connection between people and landscape? That's an interesting question. <laughs> My answer is we cannot、uh, break the connection between people and landscape. My photography、uh, is very close to people's life and the social program. And the why I, I want to take those things is、uh, I want to know that、uh, why we are living or why we are in this world. Your story is a story of people, basically. What's your next project? What, what are you working on at the moment? My next project is uh, uh, about uh, Oku Aizu. I live in Aizu, yeah? Yeah. There is a more hard area in Aizu, more mountain, more mountain food. <laughs> mountain food? <laughs> <laughs> Mountainous. <laughs> <laughs> So, you, yeah, okay. So, your next project is looking at specifically the snow country area around、yes. where, where you are. Yes. My next project is a、uh, uh, photograph of、uh, snow country. So, why people live in such a、uh, snowy country, such an、uh, inconvenient area? Why people live in This area from ancient times. <laughs> This is my concern. And、uh, they, they h a s a big river named Tadami River. This Tadami River has、uh, about 10 dam sites. Dam site? Dam.、Um, um, yep, that's correct. Dam、um, like, makes、uh, electricity. Ah,、uh, yeah, hydroelectric power? 
Mm-hmm. Just like uh, in the Korea Power Plant. That's the same uh, situation. When they made dam, so many people came to this area. Mm. But now, after the uh, after the construction finish, they have gone to another area. And this is very very uh, disrupted. Idiot. No. Are these communities getting older as well? Because across Japan, that's a big problem with you know everybody getting older and the younger people leaving. So in this area, is it a similar problem? Yes, uh, very typical. I think this is the social problem of Japan. This area has the same same problem. I planned to make a, a photo book. I want to make stories uh, for more uh, to uh, one or two years. So after that, I want to make a photo book. One of the things I want to talk about on my podcast is for international visitors, this, everybody knows the snow country because of the ski resorts. And they come here, they come to Hakuba, they come to Niseko in Hokkaido. And they think it's all wonderful and lots of money and everything is great. But as you know, that's not, that's not the reality of the snow country. Uh, I think these communities are a lot more, have a lot more value than just ski resorts, but also they're facing a lot of challenges. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in the snow country. There's a better lifestyle here than in Tokyo or the big city. And so I hope that by listening to your story, uh, people get more and more interested in, in, in working and living in these areas. So Yuki, I think I've um, made you tired enough. <laughs> so thank you very much for answering my questions today. Uh, really appreciate talking And what I'm going to do for today's episode is include a link to your website for listeners to go and look at your really wonderful photography. And I look forward to seeing more in future, especially the project that you're now working on in Oku Aizu. So thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you very much. I want to say another big thank you to Yuki for making time to speak with me and giving permission to use his photographs on the podcast website and in promotion of this episode. I encourage everyone listening to jump onto his website, www.yukiiwanami.com, to look through his portfolio of work and look him up on Instagram at Yuki Iwanami. Links are in the episode show notes. The meltdowns of the reactor at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant were the result of the earthquake and specifically the consequent tsunami that occurred on March 11, 2011. Measuring 9 to 9.1, the earthquake was the fourth largest ever recorded and resulted in a tsunami that surged towards Japan's Pacific coast. Detection of the quake resulted in the plant's reactors automatically shutting down. The knock-on effect to the power grid and other supply problems caused by the earthquake resulted in the plant's emergency diesel generators automatically starting. As such, the earthquake did not cause the subsequent meltdowns and the plant had power until the tsunami struck. The power plant is located on the coast of Fukushima. The waves it struck measured 14 metres or 45 feet in height, easily enough to breach the protecting seawalls. The inundation of the seawater damaged the plant's generators, which resulted in a loss of electrical power, power that is essential to pumps that circulate coolant through the reactor cores. That occurred on March 11th. As a result of the loss of cooling, three nuclear meltdowns, three hydrogen explosions, and release of radioactive contaminants occurred between March 12th to 15th. A level 7 event on the International Nuclear Event Scale, INES, Only the second such event, following on from the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. I was living in Japan at the time and can attest that the shock of the earthquake and tsunami was quickly replaced by concern about what was happening at the power plant. 
In the days that followed, the government declared a 20 kilometre exclusion zone around the plant and evacuated 110,000 residents. Many people were fearful about what was taking place inside the plant and exclusion zone, and to this day, many people also remain distrustful of the government in relation to this issue. Today, the exclusion zone remains in place, with residents being encouraged to return to other affected areas. Some have returned, some have not. Some people do so willingly, while some want to but cannot. And some do not want to return but have no choice. Of course, some never left. Coverage of the plant in Japan is understandably framed in relation to environmental impacts for and effects on the country as a whole, and particularly the potential impact on Tokyo. It is far less common to listen to or read reports of the effects of people living in Fukushima. And this is what led me to discover Yuki's photography. To date, four of Yuki's projects have been focused on the aftermath of the disasters in relation to local people. Each project has dealt with a different aspect of the aftermath, including Blue Persimmons, that explores the physical and mental boundaries of the exclusion zone and its impact on people's lives and relationships, while One Last Hug documents people still searching for their missing children. Threads in the Dark profiles the role of traditional festivals and performing arts in connecting displaced and affected communities to their land in Fukushima, Miyagi, and Iwate. And finally, Kara Suzaki documents a horse riding festival in the Soso district in the Fukushima prefecture, an area devastated by the tsunami and nearby power plant, in which the festival celebrates the heritage of, it, of the area and plays a significant role in maintaining a community brutalized by the events of 12 years ago. Yuki's work portrays both the landscape, broken, ravaged, divided and empty, and the people within it. People and communities that are also ravaged and divided, but the strong emotion that comes through his photography, at least for me, is that they are not broken. Yes, bonds are tested, but they prevail. Some people won't return, but others never left and remain to rebuild what once was. As stated on Yuki's website, after the earthquake, the meaning of festivals and performing arts has changed. The communities themselves disappeared or were forcibly evicted from their land, and their connection to the land itself and connection to the gods was severed. The only thing that connects them to their former land is the festivals and folk performing arts. The only way to connect is to keep the festivals and performing arts alive. What's more, this is the only thing that connects the people who once shared roots in the same land. The displaced residents can come together for festivals and performances. They are able to connect with their hometown. They don't want to lose the only connection they have to their hometown, and they are trying to keep it alive in any way they can, even if that means putting their own lives on hold, as if they are spinning the only thread left in the darkness. As Yuki stated in the interview, people are the product of their hometowns and their land, and the ongoing displacement of many people in Fukushima is much like the refugees he has photographed abroad. It occurred to me that in my chat with Kevin, we had discussed how his experience of the earthquake and its aftermath had revealed what might be described as the essence of Japan or Japanese-ness, while the ongoing situation in Fukushima, and it should be said other areas of Japan, as documented by Yuki's photography, perhaps reveals the essence of being human and the fundamental role that connection to home, community and tradition plays for all of us. It's important to restate that the coastal areas of Fukushima devastated by the tsunami and where the power plant is located are not designated as snow country. However, areas of Fukushima are, including Aizu, where Yuki lives, and areas of other affected prefectures, including all of Iwate Prefecture to the north. When I look at Yuki's photography, I see strength and pride of people who seek to maintain their connection to a landscape that has forever been changed, a landscape that is now synonymous with the disasters but remains their home. I was interested to hear that Yuki's current project focuses on communities in the Oku Aizu area of the snow country, a region that has long been undervalued and the people have left and where life felt too difficult to continue. I look forward to seeing that photography, as these sentiments often also prevail across the snow country, long regarded as a place that is difficult to live, which I'm sad to say is often framed in purely economic terms of cost of heating, clearing snow, and maintaining services to an aging population. While these considerations are of course valid, they should not obscure the more important consideration 
of helping people find and maintain pride in the place they call home. This certainly comes through in Yuki's photography, which portrays the pride and resilience of the people of Fukushima and that life goes on in a landscape that is forever changed but remains home to many. Sometimes I don't exactly know why I want to interview a specific person or focus on a specific topic for this podcast. It's often just intuitive that the person or conversation will touch upon something elemental about Japan, the snow country, or things that we all also value. I think Yuki's photography does just that. That's it for today's episode. A final thank you to Yuki for making time to speak with me and sharing images to use for today's episode. Make sure to check out the episode page on the Snow Country Stories Japan website or the show notes for links to his website and Instagram. As mentioned, the next episode of the podcast will be the final one for this season, but also the first of my intended travel guides to destinations in the snow country. Available in a couple of weeks' time, episode 12 of the pod will be a travel guide for Togakushi. Located just outside Nagano City, Tokakushi is home to some of the most important Shinto shrines in Japan, which are spread through a beautiful forest and connected by hiking trails, along with the legendary local ninja, that's right, real mountain ninja, acclaimed bamboo craft, famous soba, and a gem of a ski resort, actually the nearest ski resort to Nagano City. It's one of my favorite destinations in the snow country, and I look forward to bringing you that travel guide in a couple of weeks' time. If you're enjoying the podcast, please make sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share it. And as always, I love hearing from listeners, so please feel free to get in touch with feedback, requests, and suggestions. My name is Peter Carnell. This has been Snow Country Stories Japan. We'll speak again in a couple of weeks. Bye for now.